Hey, Hammy here, back with part three of section 6.2, in which we're going to look at some things in genetics that don't quite follow uh, some of the rules and stuff that, that Mendel found in his uh, research with the pea plants. Okay, one thing that we've noticed is that Mendel may have been very, very lucky. Of the seven traits he looked at with the pea plants, all of the traits were on different chromosomes, okay? So they were not linked, okay? Remember we said in previous videos, if they're on the same chromosome, they'll be passed together, and his laws of independent assortment and segregation do not apply. Um, but his, his uh, things that he looked at, his traits were all on different chromosomes. They all had two alleles. And they were completely, one allele was dominant over the other. So purple was dominant over white, uh, round over wrinkled, yellow over green. So it had all had two alleles dominant over the other. Uh, but since then, we found out that there are different other types of inheritance patterns that we find in nature. Uh, one example being co-dominance. Okay, co means together. So dominant together. Uh, this is when you have one gene with two alleles, but the alleles are uh, expressed equally. So they both show up. So in co-dominant traits, some examples uh, would be roan cattle. Okay, roan is where you get kind of this red and white color white, and these red spots show up because uh, red and white, they're both kind of dominant. They're not dominant over each other. So in some parts of the animals, red shows up. Other parts of the animal, the white shows up. Uh, another example uh, would be speckled chickens. Okay, and speckled chickens here, you can see some of the feathers are black, some of the feathers are white. So you get this pattern of both, uh, both traits showing up. Uh, and the one kind of covered up by me here are flowers that are kind of swirled with different colors. Okay, because they're not blending together, they're making actually two separate colors are showing up in that flower because the alleles are co-dominant. They're both dominant alongside each other. Another example is incomplete dominance. Okay, this is where one allele is not completely dominant over another, so you get an intermediate or blended phenotype. Okay, Hammy here. I'm going to jump in for one quick second here. I totally forgot when I recorded the first time, I wanted to mention something about incomplete dominance here. Uh, some examples of where one allele isn't dominant over another allele. Okay, so we're talking one gene, okay, but two alleles, okay, two alleles, but the alleles aren't completely dominant over one. A uh, famous example that you might want to write down are snapdragons, which are a type of flower. And in the classic snapdragons example, uh, you see that if you have two alleles for red, the flower is red. If you have two recessive alleles, the flower is white. Well, we would think they're recessive, but when we do crosses, look at what all the heterozygotes are. Pink. Okay, so when you cross red and white, it kind of blends the two colors together. It meshes them together, and you get kind of this pink color. Um, so you might also see Punnett square sometimes for incomplete dominance uh, where you're crossing a heterozygote. And then those traits, you'll get all of the traits in the offspring. Okay, so you have big R, little r, and same thing down the other side. Now look, you get a one-fourth chance of getting a red flower. Okay, one-half, two out of four, 50% chance of getting a pink flower. And a one-fourth chance of getting the white flower. Uh, so I just wanted to jump in here and kind of give you some examples, uh, jot down some of these examples here uh, so you remember this. This is an important concept to remember that I forgot to mention the first time I recorded. Example would be multiple alleles are traits controlled by two or more. So two or more, that's where we get the term multiple alleles. Uh, for example, if you look at rabbit coat color, down here, you see that there are multiple alleles that a rabbit can have for coat color. So they can have a dominant, capital C, which gives them a brown coat, the chinchilla allele, the Himalayan allele, and the albino allele. Okay. 
Now notice with multiple alleles, there's more than one allele, but there's still just one gene. So they have one gene for coat color, but they could have any one of these four alleles in that spot. And there's kind of an order of dominance over each other, okay? So the wild type brown fur is allele over the chinchilla type. So if you have big C, big C, you'd have brown fur. If you had big C and then little c, ch, okay, this is going to be dominant over that. So you'd still have brown fur. If you had big C, little c, okay, that's dominant over the albina type. So you'd still have brown fur. Okay, the chinchilla uh, trait is dominant over the Himalayan. So if you'd have little c, ch for chinchilla trait and little c, h for Himalayan trait, it would still be the chinchilla trait, the black tipped white fur. Okay, the Himalayan trait, uh, you have to have little c, h, little c, h for the Himalayan, or you could have little c, little h, and that would, the only one it would be dominant over is the albino allele here. So they'd be mostly white with black tipped paws and nose and tail. Uh, the albino is completely recessive allele. And so the only way you can get albino rabbit is with two lowercase, two recessive alleles. Uh, an example of multiple alleles and codominance in humans is the ABO blood type. Okay, so now the blood type is just determined by uh, these sort of proteins and sugars that hang on the outside of our blood cells that are galactose or acetylgalactosamine, galactosamine. Uh, which would be the A. If you have type B blood, you have this galactose attached to your red blood cell. So the RBC is the red blood cell here in the middle. Okay, so again, you have one gene with two alleles, but there's more than one allele, and they happen to be codominant too. So if you have an allele for the type A, the galactose, or the uh, acetylgalactosamine, okay, you can have AA or A, and this lowercase i means recessive for no protein. So you're still going to have the A's show up on your red blood cell. Now, this I for the alleles has to do, uh, says that the gene is an, on an odd, yep, messed up, is on an autosome. Okay, an autosome is one of the first 22 pairs of chromosomes uh, because the 23rd pair remember is XX or XY are the sex chromosomes okay so this is just telling us that blood types are on an autosome because they use uh, they use an I where sex chromosomes is there's an X and a Y or XX if you're female so a capital I means it's dominant a lowercase I means it's a recessive trait and it's on the one of the first 22 chromosomes. Uh, if you have type B blood, you either have two B proteins or allele genes for the galactose, okay, which shows up. Or if you have a B and then a recessive for no, no galactose, then you still have these uh, Bs or galactose, these little Gs on the outside of the blood cell. Uh, if you get a gene for each, you have type AB blood. Look. Both of them show up on the surface. So it's uh, multiple alleles. You can have A, B, or recessive, which is none. So there's three alleles, and but they're also codominant because they can both show up if you get an A and a B. That's how you get type A, B blood. Uh, to get type O means O equals no surface marker on your red blood cell. So that would be two recessive alleles here, which is designated by little i, little i, okay? So that'd be an example of multiple alleles and actually codominance that we just talked about. Another example of non-Mendelian inheritance is polygenic inheritance. Okay, and the prefix poly means many genes, many genes, okay? This is under the control of, of numerous independent genes found on different chromosomes or on different spots on the same chromosome. Uh, so this would include things like eye color, uh, hair color, uh, and down here it's showing us uh, skin color, okay? Now we think skin color has at least three different genes, A, B, and C, 
okay and it depends how many dominant alleles and how much melanin or the pigment in your skin is produced so uh, over here these are the gametes of possible parents if you have homozygous parents or you get a big a big a big a big b big b big c big c you get six dominant alleles that's going to be the darkest skin type right here and you can kind of go as you vary as you have less dominant alleles you get less melanin all the way down here which would be little a little a little b little b little c little c okay and if you look at the general human population we see that there's very few very very dark very few very 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 light but we get kind of this bell curve uh, when you look at poly a lot of polygenic traits uh, and this will come up again when we talk in our evolution chapters uh, we'll look at this bell curve again and see how natural selection actually affects this okay so uh, hair color skin color height uh, eye color those uh, when you get more than when you get a bunch of different possible phenotypes that might be a clue that it is under polygenic uh, control or under the control of many genes kind of affecting each other. Uh, one final point is that genes are not solely the main determining uh, or main determinant of a phenotype. There's also interactions with that organism's environment. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, the human heights throughout history, Okay, so this is from 1820 to 2013, uh, and over here they list uh, some different countries. Look at the average height in centimeters of the average median or average male height in various countries. Look how that has steadily gone up from the early 1800s to the 2000s. Why is that? Are our genes changing? No, our genes not hasn't hasn't haven't really changed uh, we just think better access to better nutrition okay being able to go to the grocery store and get fresh fruits uh, more affordable instead of having to grow your own vegetables and food and uh, not having to go through uh, times of uh, winters and stuff when it, you can't eat as much your nutrition's not as good we have access to that good food all the time on good health care and reducing the amount of disease and stuff and all that stuff nutrition better nutrition less disease has led to an increase in about 20 centimeters in the average human height just in the last couple hundred years and if you look back over history you can actually see uh, kind of that human height uh, has gone up and down I did some reading where they think uh, well, Napoleon, you know, you hear about Napoleon Bonaparte being so short. Uh, they actually think, well, he actually wasn't overly short compared to everybody else uh, during that time period. Uh, he was about average height, maybe an inch or two shorter. Uh, but being 5'5 five five back then was around average uh, versus the six foot tall that you would think of a male, average male in the world today. Uh, so kind of some interesting uh, things how environment has played in along with genes uh, to, to, to determine the actual phenotype that shows up. Another simple one with uh, that we might be familiar with, uh, you got the old uh, farmer's tan going on down here, or that looks like a, a trucker's tan where they have their arm up on the window all the time with their short sleeve shirt on. Okay, uh, Skin color is determined by exposure to you. Uh, partly UV radiation. So you can have a lighter skin tone, but if you're out in the sun a lot, okay, you will tan, okay, which your, your skin, they will make more and more melanin, these little brown dots over here from this melanocyte that's found in your epidermis. So, you know, an environmental condition can actually change the phenotype or the skin tone, okay? So again, how environments how the environment can sort of play a role in how the genetics are expressed or that final phenotypic outcome. And it's kind of off the slide here, but that debate is often called the nature versus nurture debate. 
okay, nature, which would be your how much of your um, how your like is genetic, versus nurture, uh, which is how much kind of the product of how you're raised, your nutrition, and all that, your personality, that kind of stuff. Uh, so it's the old how much of of certain traits are genetically controlled and how much of traits are sort of environmentally controlled. And we most scientists agree there's a balance of both, but sometimes we there's an argument of it's more genetic or it's more nurture. Uh, and so this is a debate that you uh, hear in a lot about uh, when we talk about genetics and environment. 